Hi, this is Andre, and thanks for checking out Synthesopy. Synthesopy is scientifically integrating the wisdoms of history, based on fact and truth, into our present culture. Let's take a look today at Chapter 9, Science. Science is the study of the real world based on fact and truth. This approach to understanding the world was initially developed in the 16th century and is often called the Scientific Revolution or the Age of Enlightenment, which Yuval Noah Harari describes rather bluntly in his book, Sapiens, A Brief History of Mankind, concerning the Age of Enlightenment, quote, humankind admits its ignorance and begins to acquire unprecedented power, end quote. The scientific method is a procedure made up of systematic observation, measurement, and experiment in the formulation and testing and modification of hypotheses. A hypothesis is an idea that explains something. The following are the steps in the scientific method. Number one, ask a question. Number two, do background research on that question. Three, get an idea, form a hypothesis. Four, run an experiment to test that hypothesis. Five, analyze the results. Six, draw conclusions. And number seven, you then share those conclusions with the scientific community. Let's take a look now at a science experiment. We we'll use the scientific method. Let's ask a question. Does the color of light affect the growth of dandelions? Let's start with background research. Different color light does affect the growth of plants. What about dandelions? Much, much research has been done on different color light affecting plant growth, but not on dandelions. An hypothesis then could be that one of these colored lights should make the dandelion grow the fastest. This method of inquiry is the deductive method, where one can control for variables in the experiment and draw and deduce a conclusion. With this in mind, let's take a look at some of the scientists well known in this age of enlightenment. As mentioned earlier, the scientific method and age of enlightenment came about in the 17th century. And it was started by many, but is most known by Francis Bacon of England. His basic premise was that one should formulate a theory from which logical predictions could be made, which he presented in his, in his book Novum Organum, or New Instrument, in 1620. There he said, quote, There can be only two ways of searching into and discovering truth. One flies from the senses and particulars to the most general axioms, and from these principles proceeds to a judgment and to d discovery of the lower axioms. The other derives axioms from the senses and particulars, rising by a gradual and unbroken ascent, so that, so that it arrives at the most general or higher axioms last of all. This is the true way, but as yet untried. The first part of Bacon's statement refers to deductive reasoning as described in the scientific method and the dandelion experiment. You start with a hypothesis, apply it in a specific and controlled environment, run the, exper run the experiment, and then draw conclusions. Let's say in our dandelion experiment that we found that blue light was most effective for growth. As a matter of fact, science has proven this to actually be the case. So deduction is a top-down approach from general to specific conclusion, or big picture to little picture. We started with the question, which of these six colored lights were most effective? That's the general big picture question. We ran the experiment and found that blue was the best. That's the specific or little picture answer to the question. The second of Bacon's statements, the other derives axioms from the senses and particulars rising by a gradual and unbroken ascent so that it arrives at the most general axioms last of all, end quote, refers to the science of inductive reasoning. Inductive reasoning starts with many small pieces of information from which, when analyzed, a broad conclusion can be drawn. This is the bottom-up approach, or the little picture to big picture, or specific to general. For instance, in 1543, Copernicus published his theory that the sun was the middle of our solar system, and not the Earth. 
He had done many precise mathematical calculations to infer that this was the case. In 1905 and 1915, Albert Einstein, with all his mathematical calculations, did the same when he published his theories of special and general relativity. Each of these men drew conclusions and theories, the big picture, inferred from their specific mathematical calculations, the little picture, and note that neither of these theories have been disproven to this day. These inferences and conclusions are in the physical sciences. Such inferences and conclusions have also occurred in the biological sciences. Over the course of 28 years, Charles Darwin painstakingly documented Darwin painstakingly documented plant and animal life around the world, and particularly in the Galapagos Islands. And from this data, the small picture, in 1859, Darwin published his theory of evolution, the big picture, in his book on the origins of species. That theory has not been disproven to this day. Such inferences and conclusions have been drawn in the social sciences and studies called natural experiments in history, in which Easter Island is a prime example where certain circumstances led to particular outcomes. Such inferences can very well be applied to the future of society today. So let's take a look at Easter Island. Easter Island, also known as Rapa Nui, is a small island of about 63 square miles, and it's 2,000 miles off the coast of Chile. The nearest islands to Easter Island are 1,300 and 1,600 miles away, so it is a rather isolated island. You can see the island has the general shape of a triangle, and these two sides are about 11 miles long, and this longer side here is about 16 miles long. So you can see uh, that it's a pretty small island. So Easter Island provides a natural experiment in history. Polynesian people most likely settled on Easter Island sometime between 700 and 1100 AD and, creating a, and created a thriving culture as can be seen by uh, the island's huge standing moai. And there are many other art, uh, artifacts also. The Easter Island population at its peak in 1600 AD was approximately 15,000. By the time the first Europeans arrived by ship in 1722, the island's population had dropped to approximately 2,500. The question to ask then is, what had happened over those 100 years that dramatically reduced the island's population? Archaeological records shows that the at the time of the initial settlement by the Polynesians, the island was home to many species of trees, including at least three species that grew up to 50 feet or more, as well as at least six species of native land birds. One paleontologist wrote, sometime before the arrival of Europeans on Easter Island, the inhabitants experienced a tremendous upheaval in their social system, brought about by a change in their, item, in their island's ecology. By the time of European arrival in 1722, the island's population had dropped to 2,500 from a high of approximately 15,000 just a century earlier." End quote. So by the time of European arrival in 1722, 21 species of trees and all species of land birds had become extinct through some combination of over-harvesting and over-hunting. The island was largely deforested and it did not have any trees more than 10 feet tall. Loss of large trees meant that inhabitants were no longer able to build seaworthy vessels, significantly decreasing their fishing abilities. Another theory regarding the deforestation that caused such ecological and social damage was that the large trees were used as rollers to move hundreds of these stone moai statues from an island rock quarry to their place for mounting near the shore. Deforestation also affected agricultural production on the island. At first, the native tropical forests provided an ideal shade cover and retention for soil, but with much of the native forest being destroyed with no shade or soil retention, the topsoil eroded, causing a sharp decline in agricultural production. This decline was further impacted by the collapse in the seabird populations as a potential source of food. So overpopulation with extreme deforestation that led to the inability to build boats for fishing 
the degradation of the soil for farming, the extinction of land birds, and the collapse of the seabird populations are thought to have been the main causes for the significant decline in the island population. The inhabitants unknowingly, over generations, depleted and degraded their limited resources on the island, which led to a catastrophic decrease in population. Now, if you're still watching this video, you might very well be lost with all this information thrown at you in run-on sentences. So, picture's worth a thousand words. Here is a picture of what Easter Island may have looked like when it was first settled by the Polynesians in 1000 AD. Here's what it looks like, probably what it looked like in 1722, but this is a modern picture from today. So, let's look over here at the pre-Polynesian settlement in the year 1000. You can see many 50-foot palm trees. And the, those palm trees were used to make seaworthy vessels to go far in, in, into the ocean and, and uh, do lots of fishing. Look over here. There are no more 50-foot tall palm trees. Look at the lush greenery here in the background. That's areas for obviously huge plant growth and probably lots of uh, land animals in there and birds as well. What do you see over here? None. Just grass. Picture here, as I said, many land birds flying around and nesting in those trees in that environment. How many land birds do you see I think living over here? Not that many. That goes for seabird populations as well. I'm sure there were many seabird populations here along the shores flying out to do their hunting and coming back. Nowadays there are far fewer seabirds. So if you look at these two pictures you can see a catastrophic event that took place. A catastrophic event was the decrease in population due to such a huge impact on the environment. Recall some time before the arrival of Europeans on Easter Island? The inhabitants experienced a tremendous upheaval in their social system brought about by a change in the island's ecology. By the time of European arrival in 1722, the island's population had dropped to 2,500 from a high of approximately 15,000. That was just a century earlier. I wonder what the social and political environment in Easter Island was like over those 100 years. That's 15,000 people down to 2,500 on a small island. That's an 83% decrease in just four generations. That mustn't have been very pleasant, losing 12,500 out of 15,000 inhabitants caused by a tremendous upheaval. To me, that sounds pretty catastrophic. So the conclusion here, then, is that environmental, social, and political aspects of a society can have a tremendous effect on the future of that society. As citizens in a democratic republic deciding the future of the USA, we should keep this Easter Island natural experiment in mind when voting for our representatives in office to make sure they're leading our country, and the world really, in the right direction. If we are not knowledgeable citizens ourselves when exercising our right to vote in our democratic republic, we may not make the best decisions for our country, and we risk losing our role as the most powerful country in the world, and theoretically, in long historical terms, we risk going in the direction of Easter Island.